can't, my mic's hot. Good morning and welcome to Madison Church of Christ. Thank you for joining us for worship this morning. It's just a blessing to get to be here together with you for worship. Uh, there are some announcements in your bulletin I'd like to highlight. Uh, first of which is that there is Kid Zone today during the sermon. Uh, so when I get up to start speaking, I'll dismiss the kids and they can go, or they can all head downstairs and they'll have more fun down there than we will up here. Uh, and uh, then following the service today, there are board and CCW meetings. So board meets under the balcony and CCW meets downstairs. Uh, we just started last week uh, a prayer meeting time at our church at 7 o'clock on Wednesday nights. And so that's an opportunity you have just to come together with a group of people at Madison Church and, and spend some time in prayer. So that's Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock here at the church, and you're invited to be a part of that. Uh, next Sunday is our annual meeting. And for the last few years, we've been doing that in the worship service. But now where we have two worship services on a Sunday morning, that wasn't going to work out very good. So we're going to put it uh, during the Sunday school hour in between the two services. So next week at 930, uh, we'll, we'll have our annual meeting. It probably won't last the whole Sunday school hour. So when we're done with the annual meeting, we'll, we'll go to our Sunday school classes. And uh, you're invited to be a part of... Uh, of the annual meeting. Uh, Madison members are eligible to vote at that meeting, and uh, in, in both lobbies right now, there are, there, there's a, an annual book for Madison and also the minutes from last year's meeting for you to take, and you can look at that in, in advance of next week's meeting. Uh, next week, uh, in the evening, will be, will be Madison Youth Group over at my house, and then uh, also you may have noticed in the south lobby, there are a bunch of bins for Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes. Uh, we're going to pack those on November 8th, and uh, we're going to do it in three shifts here that Sunday uh, so that we can limit the number of people we have in the basement together uh, uh, packing those. And we're we're going to try to do it in a safe way, and, uh, but we're still going to have the opportunity to do that this year. And that's going to be on Sunday, November 8th, and you can donate uh, things for the Christmas shoe boxes in those totes out in the South Lobby. Now we're going we're gonna to go to time of prayer. It's good, so good to see each of you here this morning. Three weeks ago, I came down with COVID, and uh, Patty two days later, and uh, our business was closed for two weeks, and a lot of you offered prayers for me, and I just say thank you for that. My folks, a little over a week ago, were put in the hospital. They came home on Friday. They're doing well, but they're very weak. We're making them do therapy as they're walking around the house, but very weak, so please continue to keep my folks in your prayers. This past week, Barbara Wilson had a stroke. Dr. Hyman said she has recovered greatly. So thank you for the cards that she's received and your prayers for her too. So once again, keep Barb Wilson in your prayers. Uh, my brother-in-law, David Dayton, uh, as I said, our business had suffered COVID. He did not have it, but this past week he found he had it and he has a blood clot on his lung and he's home trying to get better. So please lift up David in your prayers as well. A joy I visited with, uh, um, with Tasha Williams and Olivia Milton that's mentioned in the prayer thing. She's doing very well now. She's going through some difficult times. She's doing well, so that's natural to prayer. And uh, October is Pastor Appreciation Month. Let's give Joel a round of applause. <laughs> yeah, Marky, there you go. <laughs> Joel doesn't really like the attention brought to him, but not only for the month of October, but the other 12 months. I really appreciate him. I appreciate each of you. Thanks for coming. Your attendance uh, gives him encouragement as well as each of us. Uh, please join me as we go to God in prayer. Our gracious Holy Father, it's so good to meet in your house, to meet with one another, to as a body of Christ to actually be here together. Lord, I pray that you be with Joel as he brings us the message. Lord, I look forward to reading your word through the service, for singing your word through the worship of song. Lord, you've been very good to us. You've blessed us during this difficult time. Lord, we lean upon you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It is great to see you guys this morning. Would you go ahead and stand as we begin to sing?
captive and break every chain, oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive.
As we prepare for communion, a time around the table to remember the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, I want to ask a question. Are you a brother and sister in Christ that practice rejection? Are you one that shows some reluctance? Or are you those that have reception? So in order to bring that to light, I'd like you to turn to Acts 17. And uh, I'm going to read um, from 24, 17. But first of all, to set the background, um, Acts, um, the first half of Acts really talks about the early church and the building of the early church. The second half is more about Paul and his missionary journey and his desire to build churches. Um, and as we get to 17, it's shortly after Paul had been in Thessalonica uh, and the Thessalonians um, had rallied against him. There was mob action, there was rejection. Uh, he was rushed out of there, both Paul and Silas. They went to Berea. And while they're in Berea, they're, they were more friendly. Uh, and there were two groups of people. I don't want to go into that, but possibly Joel could have a series of four or five sermons on chapter 17 if we wanted to. Uh, but it's very interesting because from Berea, uh, the Thessalonians actually went to Berea and, and stirred up the crowd and rioting. They called them mobs uh, against Paul's teaching, against the gospel. I know it sounds a little familiar to me, but first of all, he went to Athens. And when Paul got to Athens, what he found was idol worship, false gods, et cetera, et cetera, going on. But he still taught the gospel on the synagogues and the marketplace that gets to verse 24. And this is very brief, but I'd like to read 1724. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands and is not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. This is important for Paul to say to these, this Greek Gentile group in Athens because they had all these gods. They thought they had, to, they had even had a god for the unknown. They didn't want to miss anything. So I go on from there uh, in verse 26. From one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as some of our own poets have said, we are his offering. That was appealing to the Greeks because he knew they were religious, but the religion wasn't right. It was in the wrong place. So it's a different kind of sermon or a text than Paul's used in the past because he, he wasn't dealing with the Jews. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being in us, like gold or silver or stone, an image, an image made by man's design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear more again about this subject. At that, Paul left in Corinth. And you'll find in that some of them rejected. Some of them that said mocked or sneered. And so I want to think that today, because we're around the table, that were participating in G not only in Jesus' life, but his death and resurrection, that we are the group that followed Paul. We are those that are considered re uh, reception because we join him and we believe. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, 
Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for the words that's so clear to each one of us. Thank you for answering our prayers for us in healing, emotionally, physically, mentally, all those things are so important. But most of all, Lord, we thank you for this time in which we know that Jesus is our Savior. He died and was risen from the dead for each one of us. Amen. Somebody said something to me. <laughs> um, well, um, I do thank Joel for um, being our pastor and since it's a special time for him. I thank him very much. I thank him for baptizing me. I thank him for, br for bringing me to Christ. Um, so now I'm, I'm praying for um, the offering. Now, um, Joel had taken me to the hospital um, to, um, um, to do some of my uh, hospital meetings. And uh, um, on the way back for one, um, we had tacos, which is one of our favorite things to do is have tacos, uh, real tacos, not phony American tacos. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mexican tacos done by Mexicans. <laughs> so so um, on the way back, he asked me to um, if I could please um, um, do something for him. And he said that I could, uh, um, I could say no. Um, so he asked me to do this prayer. Um, and uh, I jumped in with both feet right away. <laughs> it, how could you say no to Joel? You just can't. So um, I'll start off um, with um, Psalms 4, 4 through 6. Um, Tremble and do not sin. When you are on your beds, search your hearts and be silent. Offer the sacrifices of the righteous and trust in the Lord. Many, Lord, we are asking, who will bring us our prosperity? 
Let the light of your fi uh, what? let the light of your face shine on us. And uh, I, that was a stopping for, point for me right there. But I I thought it was a little weak, so I had to out, uh, add something else. And I, I I came up with salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, and in Christ alone. And now the Christ alone part is very important to me. Um, any time that we talk about Jesus Christ, any time that Joel preaches about Jesus Christ, my heart jumps in my chest, and there's a warmth that uh, just takes over. I so much love Jesus. Um, so um, that is very important to me, uh, the grace of God and faith and Christ. Now faith, um, God gave us faith. Um, and if you're having problems with your faith, all you need to go is go to the Trinity and pray that the tr Trinity help you with your faith and, they, and you will receive it back 100 fold. Um, so here's a prayer that I'm gonna say. Um, we praise your almighty name. You have blessed our nation with immense wealth and opportunity. Lord, you have commanded us to honor you with our wealth, and I pray that you will be honored greatly this day as we will, we give to you what we, is already yours. Bless these cheerful givers and bless the tithes and offerings that they give. We love you. Amen. Now is the time for Kid Zone. So if you're going downstairs, you can head that way. I want to thank you for all of your appreciation that you expressed this morning. Thank you. It means a lot to me. Uh, please remember how much you appreciate me when my college football team defeats yours the day after Thanksgiving this year. I'll remind you if you forget. Uh, I, need, I, I get to do a lot of weddings. And that, that has way more to do with the fact that I'm, I'm a 34-year-old pastor than whether or not I'm any good at them. And uh, as, as Steve and Mark know, as Bryce and Ashley will find out. Uh, but uh, in my family, in fact, I, I'm kind of notorious for some pretty serious gaffes during wedding ceremonies. And I have a, I have a lot of cousins. On my mom's side of the family, I have 29 first cousins. And I'm the oldest of 29. I've been doing a lot of weddings the last few years. And, uh, but I, I'm famous there for, for messing them up. <laughs> so in my cousin Shannon's wedding, uh, she came forward with her dad, and we got her handed off, and then we came up on the stage, and I, I was maybe two or three minutes into my message before, uh, before I looked past them into the audience and noticed that everyone was still standing. So I had forgotten to tell them to sit down, and I had to apologize and let them know that they could be seated. Apparently, they were willing to stand up through the whole thing. I, sh I regret not seeing how far they would go. Uh, but before that, even my, I was uh, doing a wedding for my cousin Alicia, and she came forward with her dad, my Uncle Wally, and I, I was looking him in the eyes, and I asked, who gives this man to be married to this woman? And I didn't even know I had said anything wrong, except Wally started grinning, and I saw the groom's parents raise their hands. <laughs> it is a miracle that people keep asking me to do this. So if you want to reconsider, Bryce and Ashley, I mean, you have a chance. You have a chance. At, at every wedding I do, I'm expected to espouse the, the virtues and benefits and blessings of marriage from the Bible. And I do some of that. Uh, but at most weddings, I like to point out that there are some really bad and broken examples of marriage in the Bible. Not, in, fact, in fact, a number of, of, of marriages in the Bible are, are pretty rotten. I like to talk about Abraham and Sarah, Samson and Delilah, David and Michael. The list goes on. There are a lot of really bad examples of marriages in there. You see, the people in the Bible, even heroes of the faith like Abraham, are sinful and broken people. 
And even though they, they may love God like Abraham did, even though uh, they were m- most of the time uh, fantastically obedient to God like Abraham was, and, and although God may be using them to accomplish his purposes, they still experience failure and heartbreak and sin in many of their personal relationships. Not just marriage, but also in their families, in the relationships between parents and children, and in their friendships, they experience sin, which leads to failure and brokenness, just like we do. In God's Word, you can find both uh, relationships that are blessed, which experience the love taught to us in God's Word, and the kind of, uh, so these relationships that are blessed experience the kind of restored human existence, in which the God's de- defeat and victory over God's defeat of sin and victory over sin are realized, but you will also find relationships that are broken. Relationships where sin and the darkness of our hearts triumph over love. We're going to take a few uh, a look at a few of these relationships between friends and parents and children and, and yes, husbands and wives as well. And in each case, we're going to examine the factors that contributed to a relationship that was blessed and some of the factors that contributed to relationships in the Bible that were broken. And together, we'll reflect on how we might redeem the broken relationships in our lives and how we might experience blessing in our relationships in the manner which we were created to do. First up, in these, uh, these series of friendships, is, uh, or relationships rather, is a friendship that was blessed between two fellas about 3,000 years ago. I'm talking about the friendship between David and Jonathan. And this morning we'll turn our attention to 1 Samuel chapters 18 through 23, if you want to have that open. In the story of the Bible, we meet Jonathan first. Jonathan is the son of Saul. Saul is the first king of Israel. And by all expectations, Jonathan is the heir to Saul's throne. He is next in line to be king. This is the way that the kingdoms worked in the ancient world. The son of the ruler became the next ruler. Jonathan, when we, when we come across his character in the Bible, makes a name for himself with his bravery. On a couple of occasions, Jonathan charges headlong into fights with long odds and rallies the Israelite army to victory when it appears that they had no business winning. When we meet him in Scripture, we learn that Jonathan is brave, that he is admired by the troops, who even intervened on his behalf to save him from the foolishness of his father. And we learn that Jonathan is a skilled warrior. Again, Jonathan is the oldest son of Saul, the heir to the throne of Israel. But not long after we meet Jonathan, we meet David. David is the youngest son of a farmer in Bethlehem. The first thing we learn about David in the Bible is that he is anointed to be king after Saul by God himself through the prophet Samuel. Remember that this was a position that Jonathan was supposed to receive. David had been given by God the role of king that that was Jonathan's by right. Now, by the standards of our world, by the standards that we operate by uh, in our society, in, in business now, in our world now, we would expect to see fierce enmity between these two men. There is one spot and two men. But instead of enmity, instead of strife between David, Israel's anointed king, and Jonathan, Israel's, uh, the heir to Israel's throne by right, we get one of the greatest examples of friendship in God's word. The friendship between David and Jonathan in God's Word is shown to us in four episodes that we'll look at this morning. The first episode uh, is 1 Samuel 18, 1 through 4. This is where, uh, this is the first interaction between David and Jonathan. It occurs after uh, David slays the Philistine giant Goliath, and, um, it, and Saul welcomes him and, and recognizes what he had accomplished. And so we get this in in. In 18, verse 1, it says, After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan, Saul's son, became one in spirit with David, 
and he loved him as himself. From that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return home to his family. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David, along with his tunic and even his sword, his bow, and his belt. At this point, I think it's important to to remember and highlight that that at this point in the story, uh, Jonathan is coming to David from a position of authority and power. Jonathan is the prince of Israel. He is uh, he is over David. He is in a position of authority over David. And in fact, if you look at the kind of tenure of Saul's reign and how long he reigned for, uh, I think uh, it is it is likely that that Jonathan was much older than David. But when Saul brings David into his court, Jonathan becomes friends with David. He loves David as himself. And you see here him giving David, giving to David generously. The second episode that we get in this relationship, this friendship between David and Jonathan is in 1 Samuel chapter 19. Now, this is after David's popularity had grown to the point where Saul recognized that he had a problem. Saul recognized that David's popularity was a threat to his kingdom and was a threat to his family after Saul had become jealous. So, in chapter 19, we read this. Saul had told his son Jonathan and all the attendants to kill David. So Saul told his son, Jonathan, who who loved David as himself, to kill David. But Jonathan had taken a great liking to David, verse 2, and warned him, My father Saul is looking for a chance to kill you. Be on your guard tomorrow morning. Go into hiding and stay there. I will go out and stand with my father in the field where you are. I'll speak to him about you and will tell you what I find out. Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, Let not the king do wrong to his servant David. He has not wronged you. And what he has done has benefited you greatly. He took his life in his hands when he killed the Philistine. The Lord won a great victory for all Israel, and you saw and were glad. Why then would you do wrong to an innocent man like David by killing him for no reason? Do you see Jonathan going to his father? on David's behalf, probably by this time recognizing that David's role, that David's popularity was a threat to his success? Do you see Jonathan acting in a way to protect his friend David from evil? This is a a fascinating passage. Another fascinating thing to look at would be the relationship between Jonathan and his father Saul. It's an, Jonathan could sneak in here to the blessed relationships category twice, the way that, that he regards his father, even though his father is prone to do evil and wickedness, he remains obedient and, and, and uh, obedient to him. And, um, but here we see him talking Saul out of harming David, and, and this works for a little while. Uh, right, this conversation that we read here between, between Jonathan and Saul is, is successful just for a little bit. Saul is dissuaged from, from killing David for a while. As we see over and over in the story of Saul, he is, he's just really eager to change his mind about doing the right thing. This works temporarily, and Saul returns to trying to kill David, as we will see in episode 3 of this relationship between David and Jonathan. Episode 3 is 1 Samuel 20. This whole chapter is basically an interaction between David and Jonathan. Saul, again, is attempting to kill David. Uh, last, last interaction that Saul and David had, Saul hurled a spear at David, and David fled. Now David is considering whether or not he should, he should flee all the way into the wilderness and go away from Jerusalem. So he has a conversation with Saul's son, Uh, Jonathan about that. In verse 17, I'll highlight here on the screen, we see again a repetition of what we read in chapter 18, that Jonathan and David had an oath of love for each other because Jonathan loved David as he loved himself. 
So David and Jonathan uh, arrange a sign, and Jonathan's going to go investigate after David has fled uh, away from Saul, after he flew a, uh, threw a spear at him. Uh, Jonathan's going to go investigate whether or not David's life is really in danger. And if it is, Jonathan's going to give David a sign so that David can flee, can go away. Saul has come up with a plot to kill David at the new moon feast in Jerusalem. And um, so Jonathan goes there. David does not. David is still hiding. And here Saul realizes that Jonathan was protecting David. And listen to these words that Saul speaks to his son Jonathan about his friendship with David in verse 30, chapter 20. I'm going to read from 1 Samuel 20, 30. There it says, Saul's anger flared up at Jonathan, and he said to him, You son of a perverse and rebellious woman, don't I know that you have sided with the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of the mother who bore you? As long as the son of Jesse lives on this earth, neither you nor your kingdom will be established. Now send someone to bring him to me, for he must die. You see here Saul telling his son Jonathan that it is in your best interest for David to die. It is in your best interest to to break this relationship of friendship you have with this man so that you and your kingdom can be established. But Jonathan is not willing to do that. He replies in verse 32, Why should he be put to death? What has he done? Jonathan asked his father. But Saul hurled his spear at him, now at Jonathan, to kill him. Then Jonathan knew that his father intended to kill David. He didn't really have to read between the lines, did he? (laughs) Look what Jonathan here has to bear because of his loyal friendship to David. Look here at the, the suffering and tension that Jonathan endures, the strain that must exist between he and his father because he is a loyal friend to David because he is more concerned about David's well-being and success than his own. He's loving, loving in a generous way. After Jonathan had warned David with their prearranged sign that David's life really was in danger and that he needed to flee, we read this in verse 41 of chapter 20. It says, After the boy had gone, David got up from the south side of the stone and bowed down before Jonathan three times with his face towards the ground, and then they kissed each other and wept together, but David wept the most. Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, for we have sworn friendship with each other in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord is witness between you and me and between your descendants and my descendants forever. Then David left, and Jonathan went back to the town. This is not the last interaction between David and Jonathan. David flees. He goes away from Jerusalem. The rest of David's story while Jonathan lives is one where David is in the wilderness being hunted by Saul. David is hiding in the wilderness, and Saul is trying to track him down. In fact, in between here, in between episodes 3 and 4, Saul, uh, hunting David in the wilderness, goes and murders the high priest and his family in the entire town of Nob, uh, trying to find David to kill him. Saul doesn't have any luck finding David in the wilderness, but Jonathan, his friend, does. Look in 1 Samuel chapter 23, reading verses 15 through 18, and this is the final interaction, the the last time that we read of, of David and Jonathan seeing each other. Here we read, While David was at Horesh in the desert of Ziph, he learned that Saul had come out to take his life. And Saul's son Jonathan went out to David at Horesh and helped him find strength in God. Don't be afraid, he said. My father Saul will not lay a hand on you. You will be king over Israel, and I will be second to you. Even my father Saul knows this. The two of them made a covenant before the Lord. Then Jonathan went home, but David remained at Horesh. What a blessing to have a friend like Jonathan. To find David in the desert and to help him find strength in God. That is true friendship when we can do that for each other. Now today I want to point out three reasons that this friendship was blessed and not broken. Three reasons uh, as we examine how we can apply those, uh, these principles to our own friendships. 
to our own relationships. First, I want you to see that the friendship between David and Jonathan was centered on God and God's plan. What God had in mind for each of them was central and essential to their friendship. You see, Jonathan realized and acknowledged and accepted that David was the anointed king of Israel who was to follow Saul. Jealousy or selfishness was not victorious for Jonathan. Jonathan accepted and and they built their friendship around the direction in which God was having them go. You see, sin will lead to the destruction of every human relationship. God is the only one capable of rescuing us from that peril, so he must be central to our friendships. But, but God isn't just some ephemeral healer or, uh, of... I said ephemeral. I don't even know what word I was looking for, but ephemeral is not a word. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to go back to the drawing board on that one. Ephemeral. I'm, we're going to go with ephemeral, and I'll look it up later. Uh, God isn't just some magical healer of relationships uh, f- f- without purpose, but, but God is moving in a direction, and God has a direction and a purpose for you. You have work to do in God's kingdom. Now, you probably won't be appointed king of Israel like David was, but that doesn't mean you, ha- you don't have a job to do. God has a direction for your life. He has works of righteousness in store for you. He has works of obedience to him. He has a plan for you, a a direction that you should be moving as his follower. And our relationships are blessed when we build them around that plan and that direction. Our relationships will be broken when we ignore the direction that God wants us to go when we ignore the plan he has for our lives and we try to build our relationships around something else something contrary to what God wants. The best friendships are the ones built around God's mission, his work, and his plan. That's why the best friendships are those that we share with our brothers and sisters in Christ through the church. Next, I want you to see that this friendship between David and Jonathan is filled with other-focused love. Our world has accepted a, just a really jaded and, and weird form of love, and I think our, our children are taught by things they watch on television and, and just everywhere that love is, a, is something that we feel and about the sensation that other people make us have, and that love is essentially a measure uh, of how much we are pleased by the object uh, of our love. But this, you see here in this relationship, this friendship between Jonathan and David, that the kind of love that they share is one that seeks the good of their friend. Are you willing to seek the good of your friend over your own, like Jonathan was? Are you willing to make your friend's success and their well-being your genuine interest, even over your own. Selfishness is a sin. It is taught to us by the darkness of our world and the fallenness of the society around us. If you are willing to replace selfishness with other focused love, your friendships will be blessed. Finally, I want you to see that this friendship between David and Jonathan was committed to righteousness. I want you to notice what Jonathan did not do. Jonathan did not abandon his responsibilities as Saul's son or the prince of Israel. Jonathan did not harm his father, even though he probably would have been justified in doing so about the time when Saul was throwing spears at everybody. David, too, will famously, when Saul is, is hunting him down in the wilderness, will twice, uh, twice refuse to harm Saul, even though it would have meant, possibly, that, that he and Jonathan could be reunited and reign together the way that Jonathan, Jonathan suggests in 1 Samuel chapter 23, that, that Jonathan could be at David's side as he reigns as king. 
these two friends, even though they w loved each other as themselves, even though they had this strong friendship, they were not willing to do what is wrong for the sake of their friendship. They weren't, they weren't willing to practice unrighteousness and be disobedient to God for the sake of their friendship. Jonathan did not let the strength or power of his friendship lead him into the evil of abandoning his father or his responsibilities to the army of Israel as prince. And this is important for us today. See, your friendships, even the closest, most intimate friendships, are not an excuse to sin. If you start to value your friendships, your social circle, and this is true of romantic love as well, if you value that relationship more than righteousness, that's doing what's right in God's eye, being right with God, if you value that relationship more than righteousness and, and you sin in pursuit of that relationship, then inadvertently and unknowingly you will have broken that relationship that you coveted so desperately. Righteousness is the foundation of a blessed relationship. And so if you are in a friendship where you find yourself, uh, find yourself thinking that if you were to do something wrong or evil, that if you were to uh, unprioritize obedience to God, and fellowship with God's people for the sake of that friendship, then, then you are being led down a path to a broken relationship. You need to prioritize righteousness the way that David and Jonathan did, where they were able to practice friendship and show their devotion to one another while remaining obedient to God's command to not lay a hand on the Lord's anointed, King Saul. So committed was Jonathan to righteousness, and his duty in his position that he died in battle next to his father, away from David, his closest friend. But Jonathan died doing the right thing, according to righteousness. Righteousness is more important than our friendships and our relationships. And if we don't put them in the right order, we'll lose both. I told you that Jonathan died in battle when news of Jonathan's death reaches David. David says a lament to the Lord. This recorded in 2 Samuel chapter 1. This is, this is how it reads, starting in verse 25 of 2 Samuel 1. It says, How the mighty have fallen in battle. Jonathan lays slain on your heights. I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother. You were very dear to me. Your love for me was wonderful, more wonderful than that of women. Your love for me was wonderful. That's David's reflection on this friendship that he shared with Jonathan. Would you like for a friend to pronounce those words over you at your funeral? I know I would. In order for us to be in a position like Jonathan was, where we can have proclaimed over us when we're done and all through that our love for our friends was wonderful, then we need to be a blessed friend, not a broken friend. Blessed friendships are centered on God and God's plan. They're filled with other-focused love. And they practice righteousness first. Find those kinds of friends and be that kind of friend in your relationships and you'll be blessed. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we have the greatest friend in your son Jesus. And dear God, he has shown us a way of love and mercy and forgiveness and also speaking the truth, confronting sin. Dear God, help us to be a friend to others in a way that is blessed.
Help us to redeem our friendships, uh, not, not to follow them into evil or disobedience, but to walk towards righteousness together, centered around your plan and offering each other love that is generous. We pray this in your name. Amen. Would you stand as we close today?